10 p.m. at night, and I was standing with my teenage daughter and son outside the historic lodge at Mount Rainier in Washington State. The sky was so clear that we could actually see along the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. And for someone like myself who lives in a suburban area where artificial lights really makes it very hard to see lots of the night sky, the experience was awe-inspiring. And it gave me a feeling that we as human beings are part of something greater uh, than we can usually conceive. Maybe you've had an experience like that. I think many people have. Nearly two centuries ago, a young Charles Darwin had a similar experience. The year was 1831. Darwin was 22 years old, recently graduated from college. He wanted to explore the ecosystems of the world. So he joined the expedition of the HMS Beagle in its voyage to South America and beyond. Two months later, he was walking in the midst of a Brazilian rainforest, confronted by the beauty. Darwin experienced an overwhelming sense of awe. Surely, he thought, man was more than just an animal, and there was some greater purpose behind nature than mere physical survival. Unfortunately, Darwin's sense of awe about nature and about human beings did not last. Fast forward to the ending chapter of his life as he wrote his autobiography. Reflecting on his earlier sense of awe in that rainforest, Darwin wrote that now not even the grandest scenes in nature would inspire such a view. Why? Well, he explained that the evidence of exquisite design and purpose that he once saw in nature failed now that he had discovered his law of natural selection. Now, there are many different influences that shape our culture's view of human beings, but I've become convinced that one of the most significant has happened to be modern science in the form of Darwinian biology. Darwin's theory isn't just an academic exercise. It has real-world implications for how we understand our world and each other. And there's sort of a logic to our conference today. In my talk and in Steve Meyer's talk and sort of in our morning sessions, we're going to be focusing on why does it matter and what does science really point to? Are science and faith really contrary or not? And then after lunch, we're going to be still dealing with those topics but drilling down more on specific areas of science that actually point to a reconciliation between faith and science. But the purpose of my talk in particular is to convince you that it's not just an ivory tower thing, that ideas have consequences, and Darwin's ideas have had significant consequences for our culture and for your life, even if you don't know it. But to fully grasp the impact of Darwin's ideas, I think we need to understand the two main prongs of his theory. First, Darwin proposed that all creatures, including humans, had descended with modifications from an original, simple, primordial or organism. Second, Darwin proposed that human beings and the rest of nature were produced by a process of natural selection or survival of the fittest acting on random variations in nature. This process of natural selection was supposed to be blind and unguided. Now, you can believe in a guided form of evolution, and many people have uh, throughout the past hundred years, but that was not Darwin's theory. It's really important to understand that. And that's not the mainstream theory of evolution accepted today by most evolutionary biologists. To Darwin and many others, the first prong of his theory, common descent, suggested that there was no fundamental difference between human beings and the rest of nature. In the words of Darwinian philosopher Peter Singer at Princeton University, Darwin showed we are simply animals. Singer is not alone in that view. According to a 2016 survey, 45% of American adults, nearly half, 45%, believe that, quote, evolution shows that human beings are not fundamentally different from other animals, unquote. Now, the second prong of Darwin's theory suggested that we are not the intentional creation of a loving creator, but the unintentional product of a blind and purposeless process. 
In the words of the late Harvard paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson, man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. And not only was the Darwinian process blind, it was also ruthless. Human beings, according to Darwin, gained their highest capacities, not because those capacities were planned by a beneficent creator, but because natural selection ruthlessly killed off those who didn't measure up. It can't be emphasized enough that Darwin enshrined death and the struggle for existence as the great engines of progress. As he wrote in his book on the origin of species, thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. Think of it. War, death, starvation, struggle, that's where all the good things that we experience come from in the Darwinian worldview. This worldview has impacted our culture's understanding of the human person in at least three key ways. First, in the erosion of the sanctity and value of human life, uh, our nation just marked the, another anniversary of Roe v. Wade. There were, I think, over 100,000 people in Washington, D.C. yesterday marching on that. There are a lot of connections between Darwinian theory and the devaluation of life. But I want to mention one historical example and then discuss the way Darwinian thinking still is impacting us today. The historical example is scientific racism. Now, Charles Darwin was not the world's first racist, and he was better than some racist in that he opposed slavery. But Darwin nevertheless helped fuel a virulent form of racism by proposing that natural selection was a scientific explanation for why we should expect significant differences between what he called men of distinct races. Moreover, Darwin contended that the break in evolutionary history between apes and humans came, in his words, between the Negro or Australian Aborigine and the gorilla. Thus, in his view, blacks were the closest human beings to apes. Now, Darwin's view inspired a whole generation of scientists, like one of his correspondents, who was named Ernst Haeckel, uh, who became preoccupied with trying to use evolution to classify races according to their presumed evolutionary history. And if you actually look up here, you will see a diagram that appeared in countless biology textbooks uh, in the early part of the 20th century that derived from Ernst Haeckel. And if you see it, on the very top, you have the Nordic male, who's the, you know, the top of the evolutionary ladder. And then at the very bottom, you see these ape-like creatures. Note in the middle, and this was actually Haeckel's point for this diagram, that the gap between the lowest human being and the highest human was a lot larger than the gap between the highest ape and the lowest human. Think about that. The gap between the highest human and the lowest human is much larger than the gap between the highest ape and the, and the lowest human. In, in Haeckel's view, in a Darwinian biological view, this is not true, by the way, but think of the impact that ha would have on generations of school children who grow up being taught that. This kind of Darwinian racism had a horrific real-world impact on Western colonialism in Africa, especially on German policy in Southwest Africa in the early 1900s, as I showed in my film, The Biology of the Second Reich. Between 1904 and 1908, the German military attempted to eradicate the Herero people in southwest Africa in what some scholars consider the first genocide of the 20th century. On October the 2nd, 1904, General Lothar von Trotha issued what became known as his extermination order, declaring that the Hereros either had to leave German southwest Africa or face extinction. Herero men would be executed and Herero women and children would be driven into the desert where they would die of starvation or dehydration. Von Trotha justified his extermination campaign by an explicit appeal to social Darwinism, telling one newspaper that human feelings of philanthropy 
could not override the law of Darwin's The Struggle of the Fittest. When von Trotha's extermination campaign provoked a backlash in Germany, a new plan was developed to move the remaining Hereros to concentration camps, where many more would ultimately die from malnutrition, disease and exhaustion. In these death camps, the Hereros were subjected to medical experiments by German doctors and their skulls were collected for shipment back to Germany to be studied by experts in racial science. By 1908, it's estimated that more than 80% of the Herero people had been eliminated from German Southwest Africa. Back in Europe, meanwhile, German military leaders prepared for the next conflict on their continent. That was decades before the rise of Hitler. What happened in German Southwest Africa was horrific, but there were also impacts of Darwinian racism here in the United States. In America, our immigration restrictions in the 1920s were largely devised in cooperation with Darwinian biologists who decided that certain races were lower on the evolutionary scale and should, so should be kept out. The Bronx Zoo in New York City put an African man on display in a cage with a monkey as an evolutionary missing link between humans and apes in the early 1900s. We sterilized 60,000 women against their will in the name of eugenics, an effort to remake humanity by applying the principles of Darwinian biology uh, to human breeding. Eugenics was promoted by leading evolutionary biologists at Harvard, Princeton, Yale, the University of Texas, uh, Columbia, Stanford, and the National Academy of Sciences. Now, today, Darwinian biology is still employed to devalue life in the area of abortion, both scientists and activists over the past several decades have appealed to Darwinian theory to justify the claim that babies in the womb aren't fully human, invoking an idea known as embryonic recapitulation. These proponents of abortion argue that human infants replay the history of evolution as they develop in the womb. They go through a fish stage, a lower mammal stage, and more before finally reaching the state of a human being. Thus, if you abort an infant while she's still in the fish stage, it's no more immoral than killing a fish. Embryonic recapitulation is junk science and has been discredited even among evolutionary biologists for decades. That hasn't stopped some of them, including National Academy of Sciences members, as I talk about in my book, Darwin Day in America, from promoting this junk science as a defense of abortion. It also hasn't stopped the argument from being invoked repeatedly uh, in the more popular sphere by people like, say, the late journalist Christopher Hitchens in his best-selling book a few years ago, Why God is Not Great. Darwinism feeds into the culture of death in more subtle ways as well. Prominent Darwinians believe that humans aren't inherently more valuable than any other animal. So how we treat animals, we should treat humans. Jerry Coyne of the University of Chicago is one of America's most prominent evolutionary biologists. He has argued on his blog for legalizing infanticide for babies with uh, birth defects or handicaps. He wrote this in explanation, quote, after all, we euthanize our dogs and cats when to prolong their lives would be torture, so why not extend that to humans, unquote. Coyne recognizes that the reason we don't do that is because of our view of human beings uh, is really different than the one uh, propounded by Darwinism and that Darwinism has yet to overcome the, this challenge of this different view of human beings. So he wrote this, the reason we don't allow euthanasia of newborns is because humans are seen as special. And I think this comes from religion, in particular the view that humans, unlike animals, are endowed with a soul. When religion vanishes, as it will, so will much of the opposition to both adult and newborn euthanasia, unquote. This same Darwinian devaluation of human life can be found among a growing number of activists in our society who can simply be called anti-human. Today, Darwinian ideas influence the views of many of the most strident anti-human activists.
In September 2010, longtime environmental activist James Lee took hostages at the headquarters of the Discovery Channel cable network. Lee demanded that the Discovery Channel change its programming to highlight what he regarded as the planet's biggest enemy, humans. In his list of demands, Lee called on the Discovery Channel to talk about evolution. Talk about Malthus and Darwin until it sinks into the stupid people's brains. Sir David Attenborough is one of the world's most respected wildlife filmmakers. In a 2013 interview, he denounced humans as a plague on the earth. According to Attenborough, in the past, natural selection kept humans in check by killing them off. But modern society undermines natural selection by saving the sick and finding ways to feed more and more people. Other activists today invoke Darwinian ideas in order to deny that humans have special value. Christopher Maines was an early leader in the influential environmental group Earth First. In his book, Green Rage, he argues that evolution means there is no basis for seeing humans as more advanced or developed than any other species. According to Maines, human beings are not the goal of evolution because evolution has no goal. In his words, evolution simply unfolds, life form after life form, and Darwin invited humanity to face the fact that the observation of nature has revealed not one scrap of evidence that humankind is superior or special, or even particularly more interesting than, say, lichen. The use of Darwin's theory to debunk human dignity spans the ideological spectrum. Princeton University bioethicist Peter Singer is author of the book, A Darwinian Left. Singer claims that the life of a newborn baby is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. And where does Peter Singer get this from? He's told us. In an interview, Peter Singer made uh, very clear that his view was going back to Darwin. He said, Darwin really showed us that human beings aren't special. We're not sort of separate from the rest of nature. We're not unique. Uh, and so that we shouldn't be treated that way. And so this idea that there's something special or unique about human beings and that human beings deserve special treatment uh, really is undermined by Darwin in Peter Singer's view. The same dismissal of human uniqueness can be found among some on the right. John Derbyshire was a longtime writer for the conservative journal National Review. In 2012, he was dismissed after writing an article for another publication, arguing that blacks are more antisocial and less intelligent than whites. Derbyshire believes that racial differences are the products of evolution. He also believes that Darwinian theory refutes the claim of traditional Western monotheism that human beings are exceptional. In his words, the broad outlook on human nature implied by Darwinian ideas contradicts the notion of human exceptionalism. To modern biologists informed by Darwin, we are merely another branch on nature's tree. Ideas do have consequences. A second impact of Darwin's theory that has had on our view of human beings has been in the area of morality. In his book, The Descent of Man, Darwin depicted morality not as something permanent or transcendent, but simply as those behaviors and beliefs favored by natural selection because they promoted physical survival under a given set of circumstances. In the Darwinian view of ethics, morality radically changes over time based on changing conditions for physical survival. So if parental love promotes survival, then that becomes moral. But if selective infanticide promotes survival better in your situation, then that becomes moral. Darwin's reductionistic account of the development of morality leaves very little room for objectively preferring one society's morality over another. Because according to the Darwinian framework, every behavior that occurs regularly in at least some subpopulation is normal almost by definition. Moral and immoral behaviors develop for the same reason to promote biological survival. For the most part, Darwin himself didn't press this relativistic uh, analysis of morality to its logical conclusion, but he certainly laid the groundwork for others who came after. 
And again, it's had an impact on our culture. In the United States, some 55% of adults now believe that, quote, evolution shows that moral beliefs evolve over time based on their survival value in various times and places, unquote. Perhaps nowhere has a Darwinian view of ethics had more severe impact than in family life and human sexuality. It's not an accident that the thinker most responsible for the breakdown of traditional sexual ethics in our culture was a Harvard-trained evolutionary zoologist. His name was Alfred Kinsey. Adopting a thoroughly Darwinian approach to sexual morality, Kinsey argued that any sexual practice that could be found somewhere among mammals could be regarded, in his view, quote, as normal mammalian behavior, unquote, and then be regarded as all right. Today, many evolutionary psychologists have gone beyond mere sexual relativism and are actually affirmatively arguing against monogamy. They claim that we were bred by Darwinian evolution to have multiple sex partners, which means that we are programmed for promiscuity and infidelity. In their view, the very idea of faithful monogamous marriage contradicts our biology and therefore needs to be abandoned. One of the most prominent evolutionary psychologists to advocate this view is named Christopher Ryan. He is co-author of a 2012 New York Times bestseller, Sex at Dawn. In the words of Ryan, marriage in the West isn't doing very well because it's in direct confrontation with the evolved reality of our species. Ryan says he wants to save marriage by making it consistent with Darwinian biology. For him, that means redefining marriage to include partners, multiple partners at the same time. That's how he's going to save marriage. Ideas really do have consequences. A final impact of Darwin's theory has been the erosion of the idea that humans have a spiritual purpose. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the biblical tradition, humans have eternal souls and their lives serve a higher purpose because they were intentionally created by a loving God. But if Darwinism really proves that life is the product of a blind, unguided process, then God is either impotent or likely, more likely does not exist. And if God does not exist, there is no higher spiritual purpose to human life. Indeed, there is no likelihood that human beings have eternal souls. It should come as no surprise then that according to a survey by researchers at Cornell University of leading scientists in the field of evolution, 87% deny the existence of God and 88% disbelieve in life after death. The claim that science somehow disproves the existence of God or the reality of the spiritual aspect of human life can have tremendous consequences. In 2013, National Public Radio ran a story on why young people are abandoning faith in God. Among others, they interviewed one 20-something who said, I don't believe in God, but I really want to. But looking right at the facts, evolution and science, they're saying, no, there is none. Even those who don't lose their faith in God because of Darwinian theory may give up their belief in an active and all-powerful God. Thus, it's increasingly popular among some Christian proponents of evolution to claim that because evolution is an unguided process, God himself doesn't guide it. Indeed, God may not even know how evolution will turn out. In this view, human life is no longer something specifically intended by God. Accordingly, Catholic priest George Coyne proclaims that not even God could know with certainty that human life would come to be. Not even God could know. And Christian biologist Ken Miller of Brown University, author of the popular book Finding Darwin's God, which was a favorite at the Evangelical Christian University that I taught at for 12 years, Ken Miller argues that mankind's appearance on this planet was not preordained, that we are here as an afterthought, a minor detail, a happenstance in a history that might just as well have left us out. This is from a Christian biologist. And it's actually a popular view among many evangelical Christian scientists. The message of secular Darwinists, on the other hand, is that science shows that the spiritual side of life is a complete myth. You can believe God if you want to, but it's tantamount to a fairy story. The consequences of this Darwinian worldview are bleak. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. And that's the story of this conference. 
While Darwinism has eroded our culture's respect for human life, in recent decades, scientists and philosophers at the highest levels have started to question Darwinian orthodoxy. One of these scientists was my friend, the late Philip Skell. Dr. Skell was a renowned professor of chemistry at Penn State University and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He spent much of the last decade of his life publicly raising questions about the evidence for Darwin's theory. He wrote that Darwinian evolution has functioned more as a philosophical belief system than as a testable scientific hypothesis. This quasi-religious function of the theory is why many scientists make public statements about the theory that they would not defend privately to other scientists. Then there's atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel, who in 2012 published a book with Oxford University Press titled Mind and Cosmos, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. To be sure, Nagel is actually still an atheist, but after examining the evidence, he has become completely unpersuaded that Darwinian explanations for mind, morality, and life itself hold water. Indeed, he derides Darwinism as, in his view, quote, a heroic triumph of ideological theory over common sense, unquote. And he concludes that the Darwinian worldview is ripe for displacement. But it's not just that scientists and philosophers are now questioning Darwin's theory as never before. Science itself is revealing stunning evidence that life is the product of intelligent design rather than an unguided process, which we'll be teasing out for this whole day. Science has been shedding light on how humans are truly special in this cosmos. One of my colleagues at Discovery Institute is Australian biologist Michael Denton. Michael has both an MD from Bristol University and a PhD in biochemistry from King's College in London. His research into retinal disease led to the identification of the gene used in the first successful gene therapy uh, trial at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. Michael has increased my sense of wonder about both our universe and ourselves. He writes about how our world is exquisitely fine-tuned for life to exist in ways that go far beyond what chance processes could create. For example, everyone in this room right now is breathing oxygen. We likely take that for granted. Here's just a little taste of why you shouldn't. As you're sitting there, you're breathing there, relaxing, you're using up 250 mils of oxygen every minute. It's incredible. That's the, that's the amount of oxygen you need um, to maintain your energy levels. And you need about 20% or so oxygen in the atmosphere to get sufficient to, to feed your metabolic needs. The problem with needing so much oxygen in the atmosphere is that oxygen is dangerous because it's so reactive. If you have too much of it in the atmosphere, you can have spontaneous combustion. Fortunately, the form of oxygen prevalent in our lower atmosphere is diatomic. That means two atoms of oxygen typically combine together into a molecule. Diatomic oxygen happens to be much less reactive so long as the temperature is below 50 degrees centigrade or 122 degrees Fahrenheit. And this allows, in fact, the, a, a, a quite a high level of oxygen in the atmosphere without spontaneous combustion. The properties of diatomic oxygen mean our atmosphere has just the right level of oxygen we need for living. Not too little and not too much. If you raise the level of oxygen much more than 20%, perhaps certainly more than 30%, you'd have raging spontaneous fires all over the place, okay? An equally serendipitous property of diatomic oxygen is that it does not absorb heat, which has helped prevent a massive increase in Earth's surface temperature that would wipe out life as we know it. If it had been a greenhouse gas, forget it, we wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> in fact, oxygen absorbs no incoming radiant heat because it's a diatomic molecule. So it goes on and on and on. There's one coincidence after another. One coincidence after another. But it's not just that nature is amazingly set up to make life possible and our lives possible. It's also that we human beings are unique and special and exceptional in numerous ways. Here are five, some of which you may not have thought of. 
our brains have intellectual powers, including mathematical reasoning, that far surpass the capabilities of other animals. The physical design of the human larynx enables us to utilize a much broader range of vowels and consonants than any other mammal, facilitating sophisticated verbal communication of complex ideas. The human hand is better adapted than any other known appendage for the intelligent manipulation of the physical environment. The human body and mind seem to be optimized in a variety of ways to make us the only animal who can harness the use of fire, which opened the doors to technology. Finally, humans live on a planet that seems optimized for scientific discovery. Our clear atmosphere and location in the galaxy enable many of the observations that have fueled modern science. Humans are not only equipped with a potential for self-reflection and scientific reasoning, they were placed on a planet that allows for that potential to be fulfilled. Far from being insignificant specks living on an insignificant planet, humans are truly a privileged species, inhabiting a home that seems to have been prepared for their benefit. In my view, discovering the fitness of the universe, the unique fitness of the universe for carbon-based life and beings like ourselves is one of the major discoveries of 20th century science and one of the major discoveries of all time in the area of design, religion, science and all these sorts of things. The human form is something significant in the cosmic order and that's a scientific finding. It's implicit in astrobiologists thinking about looking for carbon-based life somewhere else and looking for oxygen on a planet. The 20th century have shown that human form is not some irrelevance, not some freak of nature. It's deeply significant. For me, I think, I can't think of any discovery that's going to come in the 21st century which could be more significant than this actually. It's a very significant finding. that what Darwinian science tried to take away from humanity, new discoveries in the sciences have been restoring. And when people encounter these discoveries for the first time, it can be life-changing. Every summer in Seattle, Discovery Institute brings together undergraduate and graduate students from all over the world, from Africa, from Asia, from North America, South America, Europe, they come to study the compelling evidence of design in nature. And each summer we see how the real evidence of nature, not the phony evidence offered by Darwinian ideology, the real evidence of nature can give a lifeline to those who have been told we're just the blind products of a blind process that did not have you or I in mind. One alumnus of our summer program is now a Fulbright scholar at one of America's leading research universities. He shared with us how he grew up loving science, and this, he was actually in another country that I won't name, but he grew up loving science until he started studying it at a university in his home country where he was repeatedly told by his professors that the material universe is all there is and that science shows, in his words, we are the results of purposeless accidents. Then he just happened on one of our videos online featuring some of my colleagues. And then this student, this young man said, and I'm quoting him, for the first time in my life, for the first time in my life, science does not mean materialism for me. And I started to see the signature of a designer. I hope today the same will be true for you. Thank you.